The Children's Advocacy Center is a multidisciplinary team approach to working child abuse cases. Rather than everyone who has some sort of responsibility for working a child abuse case, working independently, it's really about that coordination piece. All advocacy centers look different, they provide different services, but truly at the core of every advocacy center should be that, that coordination and that facilitation of communication among all of those different partner agencies. Because if everyone isn't talking to one another, somehow the child gets lost in all of that. So is this the advocacy center being the really the central piece of these investigations ensures that as everyone does their own independent work, that the child doesn't get lost in that process. The collaboration is so important because in these cases, information is critical. The reason that we came together was for purposes of sharing information. CPS is going to have different information than law enforcement does. Uh, medical providers may have different information than CPS does. And what we have found is it is so critical for those individual agencies not to be silos, but to come together and to share information. Before the center, before um, the team worked together, what, what happened was um, not so great. It, it was everybody had their own agency and they investigated cases of child abuse and neglect. Um, but they didn't coordinate any of that. And so what you would see happen would be we had this child telling the story over and over again and um, not surprisingly, families would get later into the system, maybe after a grand jury indictment or as a case had been assigned for um, prosecution, and parents were done. Um, you know, they wanted to do the right thing for their kids and they wanted to protect them and keep them safe, but it had drug on so long and so one more person wanted to come in and interview the ch their child and they're just like, I, you know, I don't want to do this anymore. Um, and that's not surprising. Our mission is to prevent the re-victimization of children through the process. Um, and so if you're going to tell this story, uh, before we were here, our district attorney estimates that children were interviewed 15 times. And if you know many five, six, seven-year-olds in your life, I can assure you that if you ask them enough times, is this a red sweater, they're gonna tell you no because they know their colors. But if 14 other people ask them, is this a red sweater, they're gonna begin to doubt because they want to please adults so badly, developmentally. And so it's really important that we get it right and that we get it right quickly. Having the center gave us a place to instead of kind of bouncing that child to all these different agencies, we brought them here. We brought them to the center and all of those different agencies came to the child. A parent and a child or caregiver and child can get to the center in a variety of ways. We are the first stop in an investigation of child abuse. A, a report needs to be made and reports are made by the community either to Child Protective Services or to law enforcement. And so law enforcement and CPS work really well as a team. So when law enforcement gets a report, they're going to send something over to CPS. If CPS gets a report, they're going to send something over to law enforcement. And they're going to coordinate to contact the family and to set up an appointment for them to come in. They're going to look at, is, does this perpetrator have access to the child? So do we need to do this an emergency interview? Or is this child in a safe placement and can we wait until tomorrow? So that's what CPS and law enforcement are doing together to figure out, you know, number one is child safety. Is the child safe? When do we need to get this interview done? What, and that's the first step is CPS and law enforcement getting that child here. They're going to come here and they're scared, they're traumatized, they're in a, a time of crisis. We're going to explain to that parent exactly what's going to happen. We explain to them that it's going to be the interviewer and the child alone in the room, that they're going to be recorded, and this is going to be a part of police evidence. A forensic interview is a statement that a trained interviewer is taking from a child when there has been an allegation of abuse. 
We want to make sure that we're exploring all alternatives so we're not going into that interview with one goal in mind that one person did this crime. We're here to collect information from children. We want to collect that information in a non-leading, non-suggestive manner. This is where um, the interview is going to be observed. And the only people that are going to be in this room where I'm sitting are going to be the detective that's assigned the case and the CPS investigator that has been assigned the case. Um, there may be a prosecutor that comes in and watches part of it, but typically we don't watch the interview because it's being recorded and we can watch it on the recording. So typically there'll be two people here. The, the, the people that won't be here are going to be family members. Uh, this is purely for investigators. Uh, family members are going to be sitting around the corner and it's our protocol that we don't allow family members to watch the video. While the child is giving a statement, the parent is going to talk with our family advocate to talk about whatever crisis issues are immediately happening in their family. The family advocate is going to be able to discuss with them counseling or any other services that this family may need. A family will come in because of sus suspicion of child abuse uh, and we'll do our forensic interview with them um, and that aspect is taken care of. But what turns out is the family doesn't have ways to take that child to a medical appointment or to their SANE exam um, or in general they have a need. And I can't expect for a parent to focus on taking care of that child's therapeutic needs if they don't know where they're, when they're going to eat again. As a family advocate, we're the person that's there for the parent um, during the forensic interview of their child. Um, we offer crisis counseling and resource information like crime victims compensation so that they know that their victims right, victim rights, um, to know that there is going to be some financial assistance for therapy services, um, and to also assess for whether there are um, other needs that are present. If you're going to help a child, you really and truly must try to help that family because the state does not make a good parent. We talk a lot about the, the entrance to the system here and, and how we do the investigation and, and whatever happens to these children. Some of them stay in their homes because they're safe. Um, some of them stay in their homes and get services and some of them are removed from their homes because their homes aren't safe for them. And then at that point, the, the goal is to try to get them back with their families or, or with a parent or a relative. Most of these examinations are really normal even in kids who have had all kinds of sexual abuse, the examinations are often normal. And that's a lot of times because kids wait a long time before they tell. Um, on the few occasions that we get to do an exam right after something happens, I'm more likely to find something physically on that child. But the average parent and the average juror and even the average police officer, if they haven't been in this business for a long time, thinks that the doctor can always tell if a child has been sexually abused. And we can't. You know, I'm not usually seeing kids here in this clinic immediately after they were assaulted. We have our children's hospital emergency room with our sexual assault nurse examiners that will see the kids if they say, oh, I was molested today. Most of those kids aren't sent over here. I'm using usually seeing the children who um, are giving a history of something that happened uh, at least over 96 hours ago. If it's over 96 hours, they'll be appointed over here. Sometimes it's weeks, months, or years after it happened, and this child has just finally told somebody. If we need to speak to a detective, they're just across the street. If we need to speak to a CPS worker, they're just across the street. If we need to set up a forensic interview, we're in the same building. Um, if we need therapy services, we can arrange that with folks that are on site. So um, it's extraordinary. It's just an extraordinary um, team effort. And the co-location has been uh, a wonderful um, experience. When you think of child abuse, I think most people will think physical abuse. I would say 85% of our caseload is sexual abuse. You just don't hear about it. And it's not nothing, it's not the low income families. I mean, it's across the board, it's unilateral, and it happens 
to a lot of children. And that was the hardest part for me to, to understand as a mom, especially. You know, I don't think it's getting worse, but I do think it's, it's a much larger problem than people realize. Um, you know, we run into cases of physical and sexual abuse, but by far the sexual abuse cases are outnumbering physical abuse probably 10 to one. You know, people think you know, that it's something that's, that's the guy at the park with the trench coat and the white panel van that says free candy on the side. But it's not, it's, it's people's, someone, someone trusts. It's an uncle or a father or a grandfather, a brother, a cousin. Um, and it's just something that to the average person is just incomprehensible that someone that trusted would do these sorts of things to a child. It is not so much that dark secret that it was decades ago. I mean, we know most child sexual abuse happens by someone that is in a position of trust with the child, somebody that the child has a relationship with. As a community and as a society, we have a more openness and acceptance that children are abused by people that care about them. And that when they do tell an adult that they are telling the truth and it's to be taken seriously and acted on. I try to, every time I meet with a kid, tell the kid, and it has to be genuine, I believe you. I hear what you're saying, I believe what you're saying, and I'm going to do what I can do to protect you. But I never promise a kid a particular outcome. I mean, I think it's in some ways unrealistic for us to expect that our kids are ever going to forget because they're not. And in fact, they shouldn't because that is part of them. And, you know, our job here is not to take that away because that is part of who they are. But that history is not all of them. With the therapy services that we provide, uh, we do provide kind of the traditional individual psychotherapy and, and family therapy and, and group therapy. One of the things that we have really become uh, aware of in terms of providing those services is the need to be able to adapt those therapy services depending on our child's needs or the family's needs. For instance, when a child is leaving the uh, forensic interview, um, oftentimes, you know, there is some concern with kids who are feeling like, you know, did I do the right thing? Is my mom angry with me? Is my dad angry with me? You know, do, do they love me? And there's a lot of emotion that's wrapped up into disclosing something that has been very difficult for this child. So, although we do have very good therapists here, they don't replace a parent. And so part of our focus in therapy is to make sure that not only are we providing therapy services for children, but that we're also including the parents in the delivery of that service for that child because at the end of the day, that child is not going home with us, they're going home with their family. And that's the way it should be. Um, and so we wanna make sure that in terms of the therapeutic services we provide that, uh, you know, a major focus of that is providing the support that the families need, that they feel they need to be able to provide that kind of support for their child at home. So we offer some experiential services to assist with that. If I didn't see resilience, I couldn't be here. And I think that's, you know, really the, the basis of any therapeutic relationship of any kind is trust. And that's what our, our kids and our families are missing. I mean, that in a lot of ways is, a, is, is, is one of the big missing links. Making a report to CPS and law enforcement is the best thing you can do for your child because that is going to keep your child safe. The daily life that some of these children have to go through and the, the assistance that they're able to get through the, the programs at the center and uh, Child Protective Services can change their lives so much for the better that it's, it's just a wonderful thing to see when it works well. When all is said and done, sometimes the thank you letters that we get aren't because we put somebody in jail. It's because we truly were able to get the child out of a bad situation and they're safe. I do it because, first of all, I, I believe in people. Um, I think that um, 
I, in a lot of ways, feel like I receive more than I give. Um, I get to witness and be a part of um, a, a, a healing journey in somebody's life. Um, I, I can't think of anything better than that. I think that there are a lot of really good, very dedicated people that are, uh, that are you know, the frontline troops, uh, the CPS caseworkers, and the detectives that are out there on the streets talking to people every day. And these are people that are here. Uh, they've signed up for it. They volunteered for it. Nobody is making. Nobody will make you be a, an investigator or a prosecutor. Everybody here is here because we're we volunteered for it. We're here willingly. And I, I just have to think, with all that hard work and with all those people that really are truly dedicated to trying to keep kids safe, I certainly hope that that we're making an impact. I, I hope that there's some kid's life that. It's better today because of something that somebody on the team did.